Oh, you okay? Good. <clears throat> Dennis, can I check? Are you you're um you're going to use the mute button? Are you? Are you going to mute people apart from the speaker at any given time? Uh, yes, but I think they are muted upon entry. No. Uh, up, up. Okay, we we're going to mute them. Yeah. At the moment, the way it's set, it should mute them automatically. But sometimes people try to unmute them mm. themselves. Okay, I oh, think the these are coming in. We already have about sixty-nine. So. Uh, um, over to you, uh, Eugene. Yeah, people are coming, I'm uh, logging in. Right. I can't see the, the in a, you know the, the link we are, we are using that goes live to. To Facebook and the uh, YouTube. Mm. Do you have it on your side? Nope. Um. Oh, yes, I do. I'm going to have to tag you. Yeah, if you don't mind, do it, do it, and then also, so the. So we're almost ready, two minutes to go. Catherine, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, okay. We're just double checking to make sure that you are well con you are connected. Thank you. Eugene, can you check the Facebook Live page, please? Okay, over to you, Lord Nigel. Good morning, and welcome to this fantastic conference that has been organized by the Uganda-UK Health Alliance. Um, I do congratulate the organizers for setting it up in this way so that we can learn from each other across the uh, distance between our two countries. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome the High Commissioner for Uganda, His Excellency Julius Moto, who I know will be speaking to us later on. My name is Nigel Crisp. I used to run the NHS a long time ago, and I've been involved a lot with uh, health activity in Uganda as well as in the UK. So it's a particular pleasure for me to be here. Let me start, though, with three um, sad things to say at this very... A uh, terrible moment in time, really, this very sad moment in time. And let, let us start with acknowledging three things. Firstly, that it's okay for people like me who are now retired and not involved in the front line of the activity that is going on. Um, but let's recognize what difficult time so many people at the front line of the health service in both our countries are having, and indeed around the world, and particularly nurses. And we know that some have lost their lives and we know that others will be traumatized for years to come or lost relatives. So this is a very sad moment for all of us and a very difficult moment. And it's particularly good that we've got this conference where we can share experience and learn from each other. The other thing that I want to acknowledge, uh, and this may seem sound slightly odd to people from Uganda, but here in the UK, um, we know that people from black, Asian, minority, ethnic communities have been worse affected by uh, COVID-19 uh, than the majority population. Um, I don't think we yet fully understand the factors behind that, but we know that this has had a profound effect and it is something that is really important that we need to be better at dealing with in the UK um, uh, and understanding that. Uh, and let me also just acknowledge the appalling racial killing in uh, America by the police. Um, a recognition that this is part of the background, it seems to me, uh, of this wider set of discussions at this time, which I think 
is not only going to change all of us, it's going to change the way the world works in the future. Um, and the important thing for us to do is to try and make that change better for the future. Let me then just take a moment or two to talk about Nursing Now. Um, I co-chair Nursing Now with my great African friend and colleague, the Honourable Sheila Tlau, former Minister of Health for Botswana. Um, and uh, we have decided that Nursing Now will continue for an extra six months. It was due to finish at the end of uh, December this year, but we're going to continue it to the end of June next year. And the reason for that is that that will give us time to do some other things um, because, of course, life has been disrupted during the course of this year. One of the things I would say about this pandemic is that for all of us, um, it has shown us what nurses do. I'm not a nurse, but it has shown us what nurses and other health workers do. It's shown us how nurses are engaged in everything from community work and community testing right through to the most intense activity um, in intensive care and in our hospitals. And I think after this, no one will ever be able to doubt again how professional our nurses are. So in a way, there is a boost to nursing that has come out of this. And what we want to do with that extra six months at the beginning of next year, when we can only hope at this stage that life will be a bit calmer and a bit quieter, um, that we will be able to do two things. One is celebrate. Celebrate the year of the nurse and the midwife. Celebrate what, is, what nurses do, but also increase our advocacy. Use this experience to increase our advocacy for doing the thing that Nursing Now is all about, which is about improving health globally by raising the profile and the status of nurses. Allowing nurses to be all they can be, allowing them to work to their, their full potential, enabling them to work to their full potential and investing in them. And that's what Nursing Now is about. And we think that we need that extra six months to use that for advocacy. We believe that the World Health Organization will also extend the year of the nurse and the midwife into next year. And we believe that next year's World Health Assembly will have a lot more about nursing and will be opportunities there um, for us to do more um, in support of nurses and to advocate for nurses. We also know that next year there will be the publication of the State of the World's Midwifery uh, Report. We have the State of the World's Nursing Report produced in April this year and we will see the State of the World's Midwifery Report next year. So there will be a number of things to happen. And the other thing that will be happening from us at Nursing Now globally, Nursing Now centrally as it were, is that we, will, we are also extending the Nightingale Challenge. This is the challenge to employers to work with and develop young nurses, by which we mean people under uh, 35 and under, um, and to run a development programme for them. Uh, at the moment, there are almost 28,000 young nurses and midwives signed up to that programme. Um, in some countries, they've paused it because of the pandemic, but we have, uh, and that's why we've decided we're going to extend it through to the end of June next year. This is an extraordinary network of nurses, and I do think one of the things we have to decide globally and with colleagues and friends and people on this call is how we might try and continue that activity and continue that extraordinary network of people, um, 28,000 of them, it will shortly be 28,000, I'm sure we're getting a few more added every, every week, um, young nurses and midwives from 70 countries around the world. Nursing now itself is represented in 600, is represented in 122 countries and has 660 local groups. So this is a massive global campaign. I'm delighted that Uganda was the starting point. I'm delighted that His Excellency and the Minister came and spoke at our, um, uh, uh, our inaugural conference just over two years ago. I'm delighted to, to know that Uganda is really taking this, this agenda of promoting nursing very, very seriously. Um, and I'm delighted as well that we're going to hear more about that, including from Catherine Odike, who's the coordinator for Nursing Now in Uganda. Now, just before I hand over, let me just uh, set out the sort of rules of engagement. Um, the first thing is that um, I'm going to try and keep people to time, and my friends behind the scene who've got the mute buttons will no doubt be able to help us make sure that we keep everyone to time. So can I appeal to our uh, presenters to stay within your uh, your, your allotted time. Um, 
and we're also going to take questions and answers. So uh, if you want a, a question, you've got to send it, I think, to uh, the organisers behind the scene and they will put them to us. Um, the first question and answer session will be at 10.40. Um, the other thing I have to say is that I'm going to have to leave at 11 o'clock because Parliament, the House of Lords, is sitting uh, and I need to just attend the first bit of that session. I will probably come back later to listen, but at that point I believe that I'm handing over to Jed Byrne to chair the session. So I will introduce the second session, which is nurses and midwives at the forefront, um, uh, and uh, then I'll come back later on so that I can hear some of the uh, conversation and discussion later on, but I need to go at that point. Um, you can see the agenda. We start with the planning uh, and the people at the, uh, the, the, the leaders at the top of the organizations, as it were. Um, we then go to the front line, and then we talk about supporting and empowering nurses. So a great agenda. Congratulations to Moses, Congratulations to Jed and to everyone who's put it together. So at that time, um, let me uh, introduce our first speakers. You can see 2020, a year of the nurse, update on national nursing workforces, planning for the response to COVID-19. And it's my great pleasure to first of all introduce Professor Mark Radford, who has relatively recently, I think in the last three or four months, Mark, become the chief nurse for Health Education England. So great to have you here. Uh, and great to have you speaking to us. So Mark, your time starts now. I think you're on mute still, Mark. Good spot, Nigel. <laughs> so uh, uh, absolutely delighted to, to be here today to talk to colleagues and um, really, really, delighted to have uh, His Excellency Julius Moto with us today as well as also other colleagues from across Uganda and I think it's a really exciting agenda and, and one that I'm delighted to participate in. As uh, Lord Crisp has identified, uh, my name is Mark Radford, um, I'm the Chief Nurse for Health Education England and also Deputy Chief Nurse for, uh, for England. Um, I am a nurse. Uh, I, I trained as a nurse many years ago and worked in emergency care and I still work now as a research academic here in uh, England uh, looking at a number of areas notably around workforce but my, my primary day job is leading the NHS's training and education body and uh, as colleagues will be familiar uh, training and education is such an integral part uh, of uh, nursing um, and uh, other health-based careers. Uh, for those of you who may be familiar with the, um, the healthcare system in England, um, nursing works across both the NHS which is the National Health Service uh, which is our primary uh, healthcare delivery system. We do have some independent healthcare provision, uh, but the majority is a free to access healthcare system um, through general taxation. But we also have social care, which uh, is often described um, as a part of um, our healthcare system, which supports uh, community based provision, including those uh, uh, care homes and other types of environment. The reason for describing this importantly is because, in terms of our COVID planning response, the integration between our healthcare system and our social care system has been quite critical. And nursing has been fundamentally importantly linked across those two. Uh, areas of domains. But to start out with some uh, statistics in terms of nursing across the United Kingdom, we currently have 650,000 nurses who are registered in England uh, across all of our domains, including our devolved nations of Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales and England. My domain um, is, is England and in our NHS in England we have 380,000 nurses. Uh, these are registered nurses. Um, working in the NHS. They are supported by about 250,000 uh, support workers allied uh, to nursing. Um, and uh, we have about 50,000 nurses working in social care provision. So these are colleagues who would be traditionally working in care homes for, for the elderly. Um, our response to COVID, like many nations across the globe, has been rapidly um, developed uh, primarily around a number of areas. Um, I think all of us working in health leadership have found the last six months hugely challenging, hugely challenging in relation to our ability to respond to the needs of the COVID pandemic. 
Um, and nursing has fundamentally been central to that uh, process. And, and I am very, very proud of all of our nurses across health and social care um, across the globe that have stepped up using their skill, their knowledge and their expertise, uh, whether that's in frontline care, whether that's um, in research, whether that's in public health or leadership, we have all played quite a significant role in uh, dealing with the challenges that the pandemic has, has presented. And one of the things in the UK and England that we are pr proud of most as well is the relationships and the leadership that works across systems of care. So my role in Health Education England leading the training component as well as our Chief Nursing Officer Ruth May um, uh, who leads uh, the system response in relation to NHS England and importantly um, colleagues such as Professor Dame Donna Kinnear from the Royal College of Nursing, a really powerful and influential professional body and union for nurses uh, across the United Kingdom and we have worked intrinsically together to leverage as much of that nursing expertise as we possibly can in relation to uh, dealing with the COVID response. If I can talk about our response, in the early phases, there was, like many countries, we have faced significant challenges in trying to uh, uh, understand the pandemic as it's worked through other countries. And most of our evidence emerged from both China, um, as well as also our European colleagues, notably Italy. And again, colleagues from China and Italy, our nursing colleagues have been extremely generous in sharing with us their experience and data and intelligence, which is why I'm really grateful for the opportunity today to learn from other colleagues about your experiences uh, across uh, Uganda and, and elsewhere in relation to supporting and understanding our COVID response. Our initial response has primarily been around focus two areas, which is support and strengthening the workforce in relation to our hospital response to COVID. And that primarily was about making sure that we had um, en enough uh, high level um, emergency as well as also high dependency critical care capability. And again, very proud of the work we've achieved nationally in terms of the support of training and education of nurses to work in different settings. So many nurses who worked not traditionally in intensive care and high dependency were rapidly trained to support a response to so we could open up as much emergency care and critical care capacity as response to deal with the wave of the pandemic, particularly in the early phases. But also our social care colleagues in terms of their support for importantly areas such as, uh, as care homes. Alongside that, we have had public health nursing, we've had um, testing as well as also importantly, um, uh, support in terms of social care provision, in terms of the nursing response to support communities as well as also those patients who were discharged from hospitals into care homes and community settings, uh, wraparound support for those patients who were very, very high risk and needed shielding in communities, so our general practice nursing in terms of their support to different approaches. So nursing was integral to every sector of our health and care system in terms of response to specific population and groups of, of work as wider strategies that the government employed in terms of both social distancing measures implemented. So from the UK perspective, um, you will have seen from press reports that sadly uh, nearly uh, 40,000 um, uh, people have died in the UK. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people have been infected. Sadly, large numbers of our healthcare workers, including support workers and also nurses have sadly passed away. Um, this is deeply, deeply sad. Um, and as uh, uh, sorry, Lord Crisp identified um, that many of our uh, colleagues from black, Asian, minority ethnic backgrounds have been disproportionately affected. A recent report was published yesterday into some of the understanding of this, but there's clearly much more research evidence needs to be done. But we've had to put in quite significant and robust assessments to support colleagues from black and Asian minority backgrounds in relation to their ability to, to deliver healthcare in, in quite a significant, and again, Donna Canair has been instrumental in, in our support of that. But now the response has changed and we're starting to see a decline in numbers. We're certainly not out of the woods yet. We're still seeing um, 100 plus deaths across our health and social care system. There is much, much more work to do uh, as we come out of lockdown and nursing is going to be critical to that notably around testing strategies, notably around continued focus on infection prevention and control, shielding of complex patients, the public health agenda, uh, particularly as we deal with um, work undone, as I say. So whilst we've been focusing on COVID work, there is much 
existing healthcare inequalities and issues within the UK that need to be addressed. So we've seen a massive reduction in those patients presenting with emergency conditions. We've not been able to do as much elective capacity as possible. So our period over the next six months to a year is going to be very much about dealing with the pandemic response, the continued pandemic response. Nursing is integral to that. And also importantly, as we gear up the social care and healthcare system to deal with all of the needs of, of, of a nation and in terms of the healthcare needs, both in terms of public health, but also in, in terms of existing disease, as well as emerging challenges from the COVID response where nursing is quite critical. And an example of that is uh, we have seen a quite significant rise in domestic violence during lockdown. We have seen quite a significant rise in um, needs of children during this time, both, both physical and mental health distress but also in relation to the mental health of our nation, but also the mental health of our workforce. This has been a deeply upsetting and troubling time during the pandemic. So there are many health needs that are going to need to be explored. And nursing is going to be integral to that in terms of the recovery of our nation, the dealing with health inequalities and in response, but also importantly, in relation to how do we share our learning for other nations across the globe that are going through this process at different stages. I have learned a great deal from international colleagues in terms of our response, but also in terms of the implementation of different strategies. So I'll kind of pause there. I know there's a chance for questions a little bit later on. And I'd just like to say once again, a massive thank you to, to colleagues for this invite. And I'd just like to again reinforce how proud I am of international colleagues, nurses in their response to the COVID pandemic, and notably the leadership, uh, particularly in the UK, of nurses in dealing with this. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mark. This is the point where you'd normally get a round of applause, but you'll just have to imagine that on, uh, uh, on a Zoom conference. Um, I thought that was terrific uh, scene setting for us of the hugely challenging uh, different roles that nurses are playing um, and also a reminder of the work undone, the things that are not being done because we're concentrating on COVID and on the needs of children and, and the domestic violence you mentioned. Um, and I'm going to have a question for you later on when we get to questions, which is I, I've actually heard from somebody else that there's been an increase in people wanting to train as nurses in the UK. Um, so you can tell us the details of that which must say something about um, how people have reacted to seeing what nurses are doing on their television screens and, uh, and in real life meeting them and so on, which I think is terrific. Anyway, thank you very much for that first input from, from the UK. Uh, now, I want to turn to Beatrice Amuge, um, but I'm not quite sure, I can't see her on the screen. Is Beatrice here to introduce her as the Chief Nurse and the Commissioner for Nursing for Uganda? I can't actually see her anywhere here. Um, so I think what I will do is I do know that Catherine Adike is here, who is going to be our next panelist. So we'll see if we can find Beatrice in the meantime. But I wonder if I could introduce Catherine Adike, who I did see a moment ago, um, as the um, coordinator for Nursing Now Uganda, who's done a wonderful job. Uh, and it was great to be in Uganda in February before this all, uh, before everything shut down and to have a chance to um, meet with Catherine and, and uh, the many enthusiastic nurse colleagues in Uganda. So Catherine, are you able to talk to us at this moment? Yeah, uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, Catherine Betiodeke, National Coordinator Nursing Now Uganda. Uh, nursing Now, well, I'll not go to the details of introducing what it is all about because um, most of the people know what it is. And then also there's a website on it where one can get him more information on it. But in Uganda, uh, globally first it was launched in London and UK, London, UK and Geneva on the 27th of February, 2018. Then in Uganda, it was launched on 22nd March, 2018. And then there are many things that have happened, many updates that I could give, but I cannot go to give all those updates because it will take a long time. But the updates that I'm going to give on nursing now 
in Uganda are those which happened just maybe uh, before the COVID-19 and then those which have taken place now during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, before the pandemic really came out, um, we had advocated for the filling of the position of the Commissioner Health Services Nursing. And indeed, we wanted this post filled because this is the key person in the driving of the nursing and midwifery services in the country. But then now the COVID pandemic broke in and looking at it, we were faced with many issues. And uh, as nurse leaders in the country, the nurse, decide, nurse leaders and midwives decided to come up with them, forming of a group that is known as a uh, think tank, nurse, nurse and midwives leaders think tank group. And it is for COVID-19 and beyond. So when this group was formed, they, there were many issues that we were looking at hand by then. And we looked at the PPEs, which were inadequate. And then we thought, what do we do? Then the group moved ahead as a committee, mobilized some funds, and to which by then the national task force had already taken place. They had formed, put one in place. So whatever was being contributed had to be passed to the office of the prime minister. And then from there where it is passed back. So the money that we, the nurse leaders of the think tank group collected, they thought they would hand the money. But also we saw that we saw that it was good at least to seek audience with the permanent secretary, Minister of Health. So we sought audience with her and were granted that permission. So when we were granted the permission, we met her. And when we met her, we shared with her the outstanding issues by then. And we had this issue of the shortage inadequate PPEs. And then we had also the many other logistics affecting the nurses. There was lockdown. Nurses had to come on duty. There was no transport. And then those who are nursing the COVID patients were not going back home. So they were staying in the health facility in a sort of quarantine themselves. And they had families which needed some support. So the issue of allowance was very important. And then also the issue of the accommodation and at least their feeding. So we discussed these issues with the permanent secretary and she guided us. The money, instead of handing it to the OPM's office, that's the office of the prime minister, she advised that it was good. We both purchased the PPEs and then hand over and it will be handed back to us and then we do distribute to the health facilities where our, our front nurses who are nursing the COVID-19 patients were of our choice. So we did that and we distributed these materials to National Federal Hospital Mulago and then Entebbe Regional Federal Hospital. That's where the high number of the patients were by then. And of course, what we purchased was not enough to go through all the health facilities. Also, the issue that we saw was quite important. There were um, task force committee, uh, national task force committees. And in this, this national task force committees, we didn't have nurses in them. And we thought it was very important for us to have our nurses involved in this uh, national task force committees, whereby they would guide and see exactly what was being planned for the nurses and the midwives who are in the front line. And then they would also give feedback to the think tank group because this group really, its purpose is to support and to advocate for the welfare of those nurses who are in the front line. So we talked with this with the permanent secretary and she was very positive that this could be done. We could identify these committees and have our nurse leaders put in them. We also looked at the issue we had a, the, we had took this as a chance now to reiterate to her because earlier on when we met as nursing now the committee the steering committee and task task working group we wrote a letter to her asking for the vacant post of the commissioner health services nursing to be filled and also other vacant posts that to, for the nurse leaders in the country so when we had this audience with her. We also reiterated on this 
the filling of the position of the Commissioner Health Services Nursing, which is like a chief nurse in the UK. And indeed, she took it up, she said it was okay. And I'm glad to say, we now have a commissioner in the office, and not only the Commissioner Health Services Nursing, but also we, they, they also filled two positions of assistant commissioner, one for nursing division at the headquarters, and the other one will go either to a regional referral hospital or the national hospital. And then also, we had our press statement, which had written to the Minister of Health. So we handed, to, we handed it over to the, min, to the permanent secretary. And with the support of SID Global, we have been able to hold weekly meetings of the think tank group plan and then implement also the plans that we have we, we make. We have also been able to have young nurses and midwives make presentations on webinar. And then we had also the nurse leaders of the Uganda Nurses and Midwives Council also hold the webinar where all nurses and midwives who lodged in were able to ask questions. We have been able to produce the very first newsletter with the articles written by nurses and midwives during this period with still with support from Global Seed. And then we held another, COVID, uh, another webinar on the future directions for nursing and midwifery workforce and it is policy. And this one was supported by Japaigo. Japaigo has always been there for us, supporting us as nurses and midwives, giving office, opened their boardroom for us to hold the meetings up to the time of the, uh, of the lockdown. We have been also been able to publish a profile for the passionate nurse that went global, that is Doris Okudnia, the, the nurse who rolled a patient for three kilometers from her base of work health center three to the referral hospital, regional referral hospital. And we were able to publish this in the print media with the support of uh, Japaigo. We also went on air with support from TV and radio countrywide. And this was now during the International Nurses Day week and the International Day of the Midwife. Usually we have giving to the community and uh, having some conference, but this time round, we were able to get some airtime on TV and radio and crossword uh, uh, countrywide. Nurses and midwives went on radio, went on TV and aired issues on nursing and midwifery. And on the actual day of celebration also, they were on TV and radio. And uh, also, we have always been converging together to celebrate the International Day of the Midwife, International Nurses Day. But this time round, that was not possible. But nurses did not sit down. On their own initiative countrywide, nurses organized in various ways and celebrated in style. So others gave to the community the comprehensive reproductive health services. Uh, one of the Florence Nightingale Challenge facil Facilitator with the other two nurse educators went and be, uh, they put up a tippy tap in the compound in one of the churches and in the reverence house a compound and all knowing the importance of hand washing these days. They also went ahead, others they had ident identified challenges of procedures which they had in their health facilities and they took this day to mentor, to demonstrate to the young nurses and midwives and also to other nurses and midwives such procedures that they had identified. Others marched in the towns and in their districts just to rejoice together and ended by eating cakes and eating food together, others extending to eat with their patients and their clients. We have also now, during these very celebrations, on the International Day of the Midwife, this Doris uh, Okudnia, the nurse that I've talked of, was honored. And she was honored by the commissioner of BITVET, which is Ministry of Education and Sports, who awarded her a, a scholarship to study a diploma in nursing in any health institution of her choice. And then also, this day of the uh, international... May, day, may I ask, so you've got one minute left, please. Okay, she was honored by the Irish ambassador, and we had those celebrations. The Irish ambassador, the Uganda, in Uganda, UNFPA country director and the Honorable Minister of State honored that day. And also the minister personally, 
went there to honor Okudnia and also to caution those who are threatening her. And also Doris during the International Day of the Nurse was awarded, uh, uh, recognized as the nurse of the year and awarded a smartphone and also another scholarship to continue with her degree studies later when that time comes. And indeed with the Florence Nightingale Challenge, Uganda has embraced it and we are moving on with it. We, we nominated 20 groups for, 20 nurses for two groups. And then we sent this to HEE and we are waiting for the report to come out and know us to move on. Mulago was an, ad an adapter and has results to give on that with support from Aga Khan. Our main challenge is lack of funding for operating the Nursing Now campaign activities. And our next steps is to conclude the formation of the National Nurses Midwives Association with support from matches, document success stories of nurses and midwives, continuously profile ex exceptional nurses and midwives and advocate for scaling up of the activities and have regular media engagement to highlight nursing and midwifery activities. Mobilize support to tra of training of nurses and midwives on advocacy and transformation process because that's how we get them on table for policy development and decision making and support indeed their, their professional development. Then there should be peer leadership and mentorship where young nurses can uh, network and share their pro procedures together, share their work together, encourage and build one another. And that's how really the professions of nursing and midwifery can continue building. And much more so now with the COVID-19, which is on ground, nurses need to be skilled, nurses need to be knowledgeable, and nurses need to be on table of development, make decisions which are realistic and which can move the professions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, um, uh, for Catherine, for that, um, for that great overview. Um, I picked out a number of things there. I mean, firstly, it's terrific to have you leading the Nursing Now activity in, in Uganda and, and congratulations to you and indeed to the Uganda government um, for the appointment of the commissioner and the, and the two assistant commissioners. Really good to see that great commitment um, from you, but also from them. Uh, and what a great global story that was of the, of the nurse who, uh, who, who got the patient to, to hospital. So an awful lot of things there to talk about. So thank you very much indeed. Um, now, just before I see if, uh, if, if Beatrice uh, Amuge is here somewhere, because I can't see her. Um, I don't know if the organizers can let me know if she's online somewhere and, and can join us. She's trying to join, she was having a, a couple of issues. So we are hoping to, to, she should be able to join in a few minutes. Okay, shall I then go on to get asking, uh, get, dealing with some of the questions and we'll wait for her to arrive if she can. Yes, I think that would be the best. Yeah, course of okay, let, let's do that. I can see that we've got a few questions here which we, which we can pick up um, with, our, with our two panelists that we've got at the moment. Um, and uh, I also noticed from the chat box that there's a number of people here from, from Indonesia uh, and elsewhere around the world. So great to have you here on this UK and Africa uh, primarily uh, 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 event. Um, let, let me start off with, with the, my question to Mark Radford. Mark, um, more people want to be nurses in the UK now, don't they? Indeed. Uh, Nigel, yes. Yeah. So um, looking at some of the data we've had, we, um, we run something called the National NHS Careers website. And this is a website where colleagues can find much about various careers in the NHS, but it does have the ability to uh, take individual names and then allocate them to a process to, to go on to a career, which is um, important. And we've seen a 210% increase um, during COVID in people wanting to become registered nurses and midwives. So um, we are working currently now with our universities in England because this year we have the opportunity to grow the work nursing workforce as those colleagues translate their um, ambition to be nurses into starting registered nursing courses. And we have two primary routes, one as an undergraduate to get your degree in nursing and the other is postgraduate. So if you already have a degree, you can do a shortened course to, to become a registered nurse. So we're now currently working with the government and also the universities across England, 67 of them, to see whether we can use this year as a, a real maximizer to increase quite substantially the 
appetite and interest in nursing into new people starting in courses this September. So yes, I've got a, a huge task on my hands between now and September. Um, but you know, nothing is more important, I think, in trying to recruit uh, everybody to come into our profession. So yes, the, the real interest is through COVID has been um, one of the um, positives out of much sadness, but um, uh, something we're going to try and capitalise here on the UK to increase numbers of nurses. Let me just ask Catherine the same question, which is, have you seen an increase in people wanting to be nurses in Uganda? You're on mute at the moment, Catherine. Still on mute for some reason. Uh, okay, now. Yeah, in the very month when we are going to conduct interviews, that's the very time when we went on lockdown. But for the extensors where interviews for nurses and midwives had already been conducted, indeed the numbers were high. So. I don't know what it would have been like. We would have, I would be able to maybe give the right answer if we had interviewed and seen the numbers that turned up. Great, okay, thank you. Well, look, I'm just gonna go through the questions as they've appeared on the screen here. Um, first one, I'm gonna to leave to the organizers to reply later on. Can we get an electronic certificate, I, I believe, for attending this course? But the first um, question I think we can answer here is from Daisy Bierunghanger, and forgive me if I've got your name wrong, HIV AIDS Charity Innovative Vision Organization. And it's a question for nurses from black, Asian and minority ethnic communities who've recovered from COVID-19 and are back on the ward. Is there a risk of reinfection? Um, Mark, I'm gonna to have to turn this one to you. I suspect the answer is we don't yet know, but do tell us yeah it's it's it, it, it's an excellent question one we get asked all the time i, I think um I immunity response following an initial infection is still unclear yet i know that there was some concern for some data from china that uh, reinfections were occurring but that may have been a false uh, positive test issue i think there's much much more work to do um in, ter in terms of understanding the the immunological response to uh, a covid infection and whether that does I've, I've seen some evidence in relation to um uh, t cells and, and a variety of different kind of um, immunological mediated responses to see whether or not uh, how well you respond gives you some level of immunity from reinfection at all. And I think that'd be um, really quite critical for us to understand. And uh, the UK is currently doing a lot of antibody testing um, across the country now to understand the scale of infection for one an epidemiological basis for that and also to gather as much um, uh, physiological evidence to really start to explore the science a bit more in terms of what immunity might look like whether it's short term or long term because that of course is quite vital for any vaccine response in the long term about what the type of vaccine uh, needs to be to be able to, to, to deliver that. So the science is still emerging on that, but of course it remains quite a significant concern for our BME colleagues, um, and, uh, large numbers of BME colleagues within, within the UK. Th thank you very much, Mark. Uh, the next question was, why was a PowerPoint not presented? Well, I guess the speakers didn't want to use PowerPoint. I know some of the speakers later on are using PowerPoint. Um, the next question, which I, I, I'm going to go to um, Catherine first for, which is from Harry uh, Christian, Tur Tarn Christian Turner. How was your experience treating diabetes patients with COVID-19 and what should the nurse pay attention to? So a very clinical question here. May we start with you, Catherine, if you can give us an answer and then let me come back to Mark. Catherine. Thank you. Um, when it comes now to, for me, treating the diabetic patient during uh, COVID-19, well, I have been out of bedside nursing for quite a long time, and I've personally not treated a, a diabetic patient during this COVID-19 period. So I can't really claim that I know the challenges and how it is really to treat the diabetic patient, but this one would be best uh, answered by the nurse on the clean call side, and if maybe Beatrice was on, and then Annette, if they were on, they are the people who have been handling patients of recent, and they can give good answers on that. Well, I, I noticed in the next session, we've got um, a, a, the chief nursing officer from Surrey, 
uh, uh, NHS Foundation Trust, so she will probably have a view. But Mark, have you got a... Yes, a, of a, course, Nigel. Yeah, it, uh, we know that diabetes is a risk factor. So, you know, um, this, as well as also um, cardiac. So again, the, the evidence is emerging rapidly in relation to this. Uh, certainly my discussions and seeing some of the literature evidence certainly emerging from the UK, particularly what we call the ICNARC data study, which is what we look at for those patients who present to intensive care units. Uh, diabetes is a is a is a risk factor um, in terms of its presentation, and I think there has also been some uh, hypotheses uh, being discussed and worked on in relation to the incidence of prevalence of, of diabetes and other um, uh, long term conditions within vein communities as an area of exploration, which you know uh, fits uh, trying to understand some of the uh, health inequalities that exist within um, vein communities within England. Um, I also know uh, certainly that, um, as we know, with other types of, uh, of response, uh, immunological as well as also septic response, that, that diabetes um, and certainly uh, glycemic control is a significant problematic issue in, in high risk patients on intensive care and high dependency units. So I know that both, both tight glycemic control um, during high dependency and critical care is quite important. Um, and, and those obviously patients who have uh, labile and, and difficult management of, of uh, 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 their, their sugar control and diabetes whilst they're critically unwell is, is, is often a detrimental factor. But so, so we know much about it being a risk factor. We know much about managing it during these types of responses. Um, and we also know uh, importantly how critical it is nursing, managing, controlling patients um, a monitoring process both in community and hospital settings. Thank you very much indeed Mark. Um, the next question I think is, is going to come to you Catherine um, which is from somebody called Gaba, G-A-A-B-R, I'm not sure if that's initials or, or first name, forgive me. Um, uh, what cross-border initiatives are there for educational upskilling frontline staff in the Africa region? Um, and secondly what learnings from Africa are being shared um, uh, and this person says they'll be interested to engage in this space. This might have been more directed at the Commissioner than you, I, possibly Catherine, but are, there, are you aware of cross-border initiatives for educational upskilling frontline staff in Africa? You're on mute again, Catherine. It is on education and it is to do with the cross border yeah in africa is in africa are you aware of any uh, initiatives around that mm. can i request elizabeth and and she's going away uh, can i request elizabeth to to help me on that elizabeth ikong i can see you there have you have you got a comment on this elizabeth and if you thank have you so much, Lord. good morning good morning elizabeth yes thank you so much i think concerning gender-based violence definitely there's been a lot of uh, reports uh, during this uh covid19 local down especially in our country and uh, the issue has been basically people staying at home and not being able to move out to find what to eat and uh, provide for the family and also to meet their demands. And so there has been a number of reports through our security and through our police. And uh, the cry and the response has been to really reach out to these families, to provide maybe what to eat in terms of supply of food, and supply of, 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 of other requirements, but also to check ourselves because we are thinking this is a kind of a, a, a psychological torture, kind of, which is a part of a mental health challenge that is coming up that we need to think about as nurses and midwives. When we are in our healthcare settings, we need to think about how to handle the society in terms of overcoming and dealing with gender-based violence. What is it that is happening to them? What is it that probably 
the era of COVID-19 has brought into the families and the society. Elizabeth, I, I think I'm going to interrupt you, you there because I think you're moving into what you're going to tell us later on in your presentation. Um, yeah. but, um, yes. So we'll, we'll invite you to come back in later on. My, my, my apologies, but thank you for that. Um, that question about cross-border initiatives I see is actually from uh, he, he, George Abraham. Is, uh, <laughs> those are his initials. So thank you, George, for that question. Um, next question is going to be for Mark. Um, I'm Ida from Indonesia. The presentation is very interesting. I'd like to ask Professor Mark, could you share your experiences in England? What are your strategies to assess skill competency of your students during pandemics? Because I imagine like other countries, UK, like, like the UK, other countries have been using students or final year students at least to do some, uh, to be involved in this in, a, in quite a heavy way. So how do you assess their competencies, Mark? Uh, it, it's a great question and thank you. Yes, um, I have to say um, we worked directly with our Royal College of Nursing, our regulator, the Nursing Midwifery Council, and also across the various nations to, to formulate a policy response in the use of students during the pandemic. And like many colleagues, uh, we wrestled a number of issues, notably where they were in their training. Um, how much clinical experience they'd gained at that point, and also importantly, a risk assessment of, of supporting students into a pandemic response, which um, in terms of their normal placement activity would be very unusual indeed. So we had to formulate quite a, a significant strategic package of measures, including we moved our students to non-supernumerary status, when normally in the United Kingdom, they're supernumerary in practice all the way through their training. We would pay them, which again in England is, is not the norm. We would uh, recognise importantly that those students would need some payment to support them offering their support into teams. And we also had to risk assess those students because again the issues around competence and experience were quite critical. Our national policy was that both third years um, could uh, work within uh, the service as part of a paid placement. Um, and many students have done so. We had 30,000 students volunteer, uh, but actually as through the assessment of their skills, experience, and also risks, um, uh, about 12% uh, of students um, in total uh, were not able to go out into clinical practice because they either had some underlying conditions, risks themselves, or uh, suitability in terms of their skills and experience to be able to work in a pandemic response. And our second year students had a mix. So they, they worked uh, up to 80% of the time in clinical practice on paid placement and 20% of the time still at university. Again, another risk assessed approach based upon what we understood about their skills and experience. And our first year students, we took a collective response that those students wouldn't go into clinical practice. Many were very junior and only recently started their courses and uh, were felt uh, that we wouldn't be able to offer them a supportive experience in terms of the pandemic response. But in, in it, the wider issue is, of course, that many students wanted to be part of the COVID response. So they saw it as a rich learning opportunity to work alongside their fully qualified colleagues. Um, my personal view is that the risk assessment approach that we took did make sure that we could uh, ensure that those students uh, were supported in practice as much as possible, but their skills and experience would be gained. But also the focus now for us is to try um, now that the pandemic is, um, uh, is easing to some degree in terms of our hospital sector, not elsewhere in the country, um, is, is how do we support students back into a normal clinical training programme um, yes. so we can make sure that they continue to graduate as normal. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. You finished precisely on 10.50. Um, I'm sorry that we were unable to have Beatrice uh, Amuge join us. Um, I hope maybe she's been able to listen to some of this, but we're really sorry you weren't able to join us, Beatrice. Um, but let me say thank you enormously to, to, to Catherine Adike uh, and, and also to Mark Radford for giving us that great start with some real reality testing as well as the big overview picture that you've offered us. We didn't get through all the questions that people asked, but they will be remaining here and I suspect that um, they may come up in, in future sessions. So let me move on then to our next um, panel, um, which is about nurses and midwives at the forefront of the response to COVID-19 experiences and challenges. So this is taking us down from the planning level to the, um, to the front line um, and where people are dealing with the day-to-day -day issues within the wider context. Um, and we're going to start with Heather Cordell, who's the Chief Nursing Officer um, for 
uh, Surrey and I've forgotten the name of your trust, Heather, forgive me for this, Surrey and Borders Partnership, NHS Foundation Trust. I, I know you've, you're, you're with us here. And just while I do that, I'm now going to hand over the chair to Jed Byrne, who is here, because I need to just go and, uh, and check into the House of Lords uh, briefly, but I will come back later on to listen to some of the conversation. But my great pleasure to welcome Heather, who is the uh, Director of Nursing, um, uh, the Chief Nursing Officer in, in this important trust. And we're looking forward very much to hearing your comments. Heather, thank you. Thank you, Lord Chris. Um, and um, th thank you for um, inviting me to be part of this uh, panel. And I'm so um, excited to, to hear what's happening across the globe with regards to uh, nurses and midwives and our contribution to, to health, um, and especially during this time of COVID. I just thought I'd spend some time um, talking about th three broad topics. Um, to help uh, orientate you guys to our organization, um, what we're doing, our challenges, and some of the things that we are proud of um, uh, at this point in time. Uh, so just to say a little bit about me, as Lord uh, Nigel Crisp said, I'm the Chief, Chief Nursing Officer of Surrey and Borders Partnership NHS Foundation Trust. It is a mental health and learning disability trust, and we provide services to Surrey and neighboring um, um, regions. Um, I have been a nurse now for over 28 years. Um, I say that um, with, with a lot of pride and some um, trepidation because uh, it feels like a long time, but I'm so proud to, to be part of um, a thriving and an important profession. Um, and the three areas I just wanted to, to share with you that um, that would be helpful to this discussion is the first of all how, how are we what's been our experience of um, COVID this pandemic and I think the first thing to talk about is uh, the challenges that um, they it presented as a pandemic for the organization being a mental health um, organization uh, that delivers services for people with mental health issues and people with learning disabilities we were not seen as being part of the forefront the the the, the the hot spots in terms of um, the COVID, pan COVID pandemic. And one of the challenges we faced was a lot of the national guidance coming out was directed towards um, areas quite rightly where people with um, uh, uh, health uh, conditions brought on by COVID infections were being treated. So um, priority and focus, again, quite rightly was given to um, intensive care units, eating disorder, um, uh, emergency departments, uh, and we had to almost um, interpret or apply some of the guidance to mental health settings. That was a challenge that we met and we met effectively, but it always felt um, for, um, for myself and others that we had to really um, adapt some of the guidance. That didn't last very long, uh, and quite quickly, I think, leaders nationally um, understood that the guidance needed to be instantly interpreted for all health, health, health settings. The other challenge was PPE supply and Mark Radford quite rightly described some of the challenges and what I did as a chief nursing officer also having the responsibility for um, infection prevention and control being the director responsible for that I ensured very early on that um, our supplies were um, were strong. We tapped into our local um, NHS suppl suppliers uh, and we worked in, in, in collaboration with other organizations. And right, ac right across the country there was a, a terminology that was, um, was developing called mutual aid, which meant that if I was in need of um, PPE, then I would um, make that request formally to the system, to our local group of organizations, and my neighboring organization would, le would lend me some. So through mutual aid, we as a system rarely ran out of, of the stuff that we needed to, to keep safe. The other, things were, the other thing um, that was a challenge for us, which became a national issue and a global issue, um, uh, was the disproportionate impact of the COVID um, uh, infections in terms of mortality and morbidity on people from black and ethnic minority from black and ethnic minority backgrounds. 
And so we instantly, um, after seeing uh, the data from uh, um, the intensive care um, unit statistics and other national data sources, we worked um, in quite quickly to respond to that with regards to risk assessments and contributing to the national development of a risk assessment for our black and ethnic minority staff. We did so, um, we continue to do that because what we also find um, that we have to pay attention to is staff being able to have meaningful conversations with everyone, regardless of their ethnicity, uh, around um, vulnerability uh, and being able to continue to, to provide the, the, the work that we, that we all want to do when we, we, we get up in the morning. So that was th that's some of the challenges around the COVID um, uh, pandemic and how it affected us. And I think that the, the, the final point on, on the COVID situation for me is how it affected um, uh, the people who were coming to seek, seek our services. So first of all, what we started seeing was a reduction in people who came to access services through emergency means. So in our A&E departments, we initially saw less people coming through A&E um, who needed help for their mental health. We then saw from about mid-April to, to now a gradual increase in people coming back to, um, to services with a specific focus on how the, um, the pandemic and the conditions were affecting them. We saw that people's um, psychosis and delusions were more and more incorporating issues of the um, uh, delusions of uh, around the pandemic and also um, trying to figure out to make sense of their world that was affecting them and compounding their their existing diagnoses and the third bit around the, the mental health issue was that the, the the conditions that were in place to help uh, uh, protect us from the infection and control the spread started contributing or exacerbating uh, mental mental illness so, so social isolation was something that started to to present problems to people from a mental health point of view we responded to that by um, through a number of ways uh, including um, increasing the hours of our safe havens which is a facility where people can just drop in from the public to seek help and and support We've also developed something internally called psychological PPE, which is the label given to our internal approach to supporting people who work um, with us and might be affected by, by having to work in a different way. So that's about the COVID um, challenge for us as an organization. The second bit is our nursing community. And uh, um, I, I've been so proud of my nurses um, during this time. Um, and in our nursing community, I will talk a bit about registered nurses, healthcare assistants, and student nurses. For our registered nurses, I wouldn't re replay what was described earlier by Lord Crisp and others um, around the, the, the nursing now challenge and the Nightingale challenge, but we have um, uh, started our own Nightingale challenge in response to this, uh, which it can be described as a, developing, um, as uh, Nigel Crisp said, uh, our 20 band five nurses uh, to complete their um, uh, preceptorship and, and get involved in a, in a leadership program. However, we've extended that to 20 more nurses who are not necessarily under the age of 35. Because what we recognize is that we are attracting people who are coming into nursing later in life and we wanted to expand that opportunity. So our Nightingale Challenge um, aspires to have 40 nurses on this program. We have a range of other things that we've done to support registered nurses. For example, I have started meeting through Microsoft Teams and, and, and Zoom and other platforms meeting with nurses across my organization every week and we have a trust-wide meeting to hear how people are feeling. On International Nurses Day we had an event and Tracy Collins joined us and one of the deputy CNOs, um, 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 Mark's counterpart Sue Tranka joined us to really celebrate what we, what, what we contribute as nurses. We have um, webinars for Black, Asian and minority ethnic staff to talk about, together with our chief executive, myself and other senior leaders, what it feels like at this point, given the disproportionality around impact on BAME staff. 
And of course, um, we are focusing continuously on how we change our practice and focus more on physical health as well as mental health asking my nurses to practice to the top of their license when it comes to keeping people safe from the effects of COVID-19. For our healthcare assistants, we, we are, um, uh, we're planning an event uh, next week on the 11th of June, where myself and other senior leaders are meeting through um, Microsoft Teams, all healthcare assistants who can make it to get to again, celebrate their contribution and hear what they they are they are um, they they're worried about. I see Gerard's probably poised to interrupt me because I'm going over. So I will quickly talk about student nurses, and then I will be done. Because I am really mindful that we are we are having student nurses in our community um, as aspirant nurses, as as Mark Radford um, described earlier. But what I know, working with the, our universities quite closely, is our, our black uh, and uh, minority ethnic students are aware of racism in the workplace and have experienced racism in the workplace. But what they're doing is they are still continuing with their nursing training and they still want to be nurses. So I'm working quite closely with the university to provide um, diversity specific leadership courses for um, student nurses of any ethnicity in order that they are prepared for a work environment and and i must say that this racism is not from fellow um, healthcare professionals necessarily but from patients and so that environment having to deal with racism and the biological weathering that it, it, it brings on, as well as learning your profession and getting that from all sides, helping them to prepare for that, especially during this COVID time, is, is of particular importance. Um, and I will stop there before I say the next stage is for us to unite with Uganda because what I'm keen to do is have a link with, um, with uh, uh, other countries across the globe to help us on our journey. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. And um, uh, may I just say that it's absolutely fantastic to hear a senior nurse with such compassion for their staff and students. Um, uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm, without any further ado, I'm going to, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to uh, my fellow FET, uh, FET trustee, uh, Dorcas Guatta, uh, who uh, is um, going to uh, carry on this subject um, as the nurse advisor of the Tropical Health and Education Trust, Dorcas. Yeah, thank you for introducing me. Um, thank you for having me on this platform. Uh, I'm truly amongst friends. Um, out of all the descriptions that you've given, Jed, um, the, the greatest pride that I have is um, describing myself as a hospital cleaner. I arrived in this great country called Britain um, some, when I was 20 years old and in, in, immediately found myself a job in hospital working as a cleaner. Um, and I think to me, out of all the credentials that we may put on a CV, it is that very job that would be very telling to me uh, and reveals a lot in, the, uh, in terms of intersectionality around inequalities, um, racial discrimination, and, the great, and this great institution called the NHS that we so love. Thank you. Next slide. So as we take a global health approach to um, the conversation that we're having today, I think we, we, it's, it's worth saying that the story of epidemics um, is the story of inequalities. We've seen that with the Ebola crisis. We saw that with the HIV crisis. I'm from the, I'm from the generation of, of HIV and the impact of, of, of that in society. Um, but my conversation today really focuses on how the, the innovation of nurses such as me, who are coming from Zimbabwe and many other countries today, lend themselves um, in terms of drawing lessons from low-income countries into high-income countries. And just how that contribution to me has never been really recognized in a way that we should be recognizing the NHS. But also how do we balance under pandemics and poverty? And the tough choices that people in low-income countries have to make. And I'm glad that my colleagues from Uganda today have set the scene. Thank you very much for the next slide. But who are we? We often say BME and, and we, we're, we're not always sure about the context of who all these stories are. 
who are these people who find themselves in our healthcare systems and where do they come from and how do they find their way into that? I've put here just a small elements that the, the, this journey begins way back um, with the likes of Mary Seiko, um, Jamaica Ness who found herself here, the Windcrush wind gener generation and then Indian generation, the middle class generation that migrated here in the 60s, many of them whose children are doctors and nurses and, and, and you know, are, are feeding in the healthcare system, the West Africans and the Zimbabweans such as me. But also, um, and Jed, you will know this point, that we as Britain and, and the NHS have gone overseas to recruit nurses, such as Filipino nurses, and we've brought them here. Have we been more concerned about our staffing levels than we've been concerned about the social context in which nurses arrive in the UK? Thank you very much, next slide. Next slide. I spend my time working in two spaces. I'll go back to the first slide, please, in Zimbabwe. I spend my time in two spaces, in, in two places between Zimbabwe and, and London. These two places are revealing of inequalities. This is where the Friendship Bench project was based, and I'll touch on it later on. The next slide is Westminster an area that I spend a lot of time using greatest innovation that I can bring into the healthcare system in accessing young people who are involved in gangs. Now this great map here has a lot of wealth. This is the front door of Britain. And yet in these pockets of this city here are great um, huge inequalities. There are many people, many of the migrant families who are living high, um, high levels of poverty and many of them are affected by mental health. Are, are, are our services designed to access them in the right way? Thank you. Next slide. But here we are looking at how and we look at, look at stepped up check care and um, Zimbabwe comes up as one of those countries that is high up in terms of stepped up care. Here we are um, training health, community healthcare workers on the Friendship Bench project. And I'll move on to the next slide. And take some of the innovation into high income country. But just to complete the circle and say, here we are with a whole circle of how we can take lessons from low income countries to high income countries and the complete circle in which the, um, the, the French Bench project is being globally rolled out across the, uh, across, across the world today. But even with its success, it won't be able to address some of the core issues such as severe mental disorders um, that we're facing and institutionalized uh, um, disorders. Thank you. Next slide. Excellent. So here in, in, in the UK, we have lost more Zimbabweans to COVID-19 than we have in Zimbabwe. Four deaths in Zimbabwe so far, this data from April, and 29 deaths in the UK. Zimbabwe's economy is leveraged purely and largely on remittances. So for every death that happens here, every nurse that happened that dies here, a carer that dies here, has a huge impact in Zimbabwe, but also has a huge impact here in the UK. In the UK. What does it mean for those families that have been impacted um, by, by um, by COVID. Thank you. Next slide. Next slide. And when I think about how that is panning out, I think about the warm conversations that I have with um, someone like Alice. Alice who's battling, um, working on the front line. And those stories from the front line in, in Zimbabwe are very revealing in terms of the fear that nurses have, but also the strength that they have and the choices that they have to make. Do they get transport? Do they make the choices to make um, their way to the hospital? And do they have enough money to feed their children? I pause here only for five seconds to respect the staff that we've lost in COVID-19. Next slide, thank you. And round off this conversation and out of this, these slides and really just zoom into the mental health impact of COVID-19 and the things that we need, maybe need to consider. And I take the view that actually the world clapped for us and clapped for us and we thank them. But are we addressing the right issues at policy level? Is it enough for me that I, I, get, I get a round of applause? What are the issues that we need to address as an And how can we dare step into that platform so that we are addressing level uh, issues at policy level and entering a, a, an arena and po political level um, so that we can address the issues? 
Next slide. Out of all these points, I'll pick out one, which is the mental health impact of healthcare workers. As a nurse working in accident emergency, I can tell you that one of the things that trouble me hugely is seeing a nurse or a doctor or a medical student coming into our a &E department having taken an overdose or try to commit suicide or successfully kill themselves. That is huge. And when we unpack some of those issues, it is directly related to the impact of the work, cl clinical work in which they're carrying. We must do so much more to protect our healthcare workers. Those who are most vulnerable, are particularly the junior nurses, and my colleagues earlier on touched on who, the, the, the junior nurses who are coming in, are actually some of them much, much older. And they also have a greater responsibility of sending money back home and those pressures that squeeze them in, those social factors that really came in. Thank you, next slide. So let's remind ourselves, before this pandemic here um, that we're, we're facing, just before this pandemic, we were facing a, an epidemic of young BME kids um, dying and affected by the effects of knife crime. Those issues haven't gone away. Thank you. Next slide. And so when we talk about safeguarding young children, we zoom into these issues. This is, an, again, this is the space that I study. We think about how, and how are we going to safeguard some of the children of those families and nurses and hospital cleaners that have been affected and whose parents have died what do we, what, how, we, how, we, how do we safeguard Filipino children um, from being affected by, um, by, by, by um, how do we safeguard children so that they are protected and looked after? Next slide, please. Thank you. And I'll pause here and say that the, the, the greatest fear that we face, and this is a slide from the Regent's Mosque in London, just before the pandemic in which we, we buried a 17 year old who was stabbed to death. His family had come from Iraq, looking to find refuge here in London and safety here in London, only to, to, to die of, of death. And I'll go to the last slide and, and that, that'll be my first slide. And the case of Victoria Clembe, well, let's remind ourselves what can go wrong when we don't safeguard children, particularly African children in this country. Last slide, thank you. So what are, what are we trying to say here? That we need a new bold normal. Beyond bedside nursing and beyond um, our clinical practice, nursing needs to take a bold new step into an arena that isn't ordinary to us. We need to be nurses who address social issues at policy level and enter into those spaces that are always very difficult for us, but we need to be part of the conversation. Never again, nothing about us without us. The BME agenda can never be discussed again in this country without us on the table because this is affecting us. It is us who have been denied certain privileges and certain um, um, uh, uh, opportunities to advance because we know that discrimination happens in the, in the clinical environment. We need to inspire the next generation of leaders and inspire them so that they are not just clinicians, but inspire them at a level that they can strategize. We need to have new leaders who take, speak to broader issues. We're very good at diagnosing and treating our patients, but we're not very good at strat strategizing ourselves. And some of that work, is, that is some of the work that we're doing in that. How can we improve health partnerships so that the diversity of that health partnership complements learning right across the globe? And the last point I'll make really is around the need for nursing to think about collaboration outside the field. We can be very, very one way um, oriented and, and think, healthcare in terms of one lane. But there is uh, so much scope here to, for us to collaborate with other fields. I, I would pick one industry, which is technology. And technology is a big issue for us. And we, we use technology really well in Africa. The arts industry, we know that the arts industry helps us get the message through and they help us with, with, that, or with, with those kind of sort of healing elements. So my last really word is, is, is to complement the work that um, foreign nurses bring into this environment. And now we need to have the platform to appraise that contribution more than ever, but also we need to be much more bold about how we enter that space because 
We must be on the table. Whatever happens, our voice must be on the table. Thank you for having me. Dorcas, thank you so much. And, and um, may I just say uh, how much you managed to eloquently uh, and concisely say what so many people are saying at the moment, that um, uh, we have uh, reached a juxtaposition in uh, healthcare where uh, there is no uh, no old normal or return to old normal. And um, I, I, I warmly welcome that uh, uh, that call from uh, therapist to advocate, which you so uh, uh, beautifully expressed. So our final speaker in this session this morning is um, uh, Annette Canyon Yuzi, who's president of the Uganda uh, Midwives Association on this topic. I've uh, appallingly badly uh, chaired this session so far, uh, so we're going to have a, a shortened question and answer session at the end of this. Uh, Annette, are you online? Yes, I can see you now. I shall hand over to you. Good morning. Annette, I think you may be on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? We can hear you now, yes, carry on. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Chair, and greetings from Uganda. I want to add my voice to my fellow panelists to appreciate this great opportunity that has been given to us to amplify the nurses and midwives voice. It appears we may have some technological issues. Yes, it looks right, probably. Annette, can you hear us? Okay, folks, um, uh, uh, apologies for the technology. I suspect we, we have some uh, broadband uh, issues between here and Uganda. Um, given uh, the timing. Uh, if Annette rejoins us back online, uh, I'll interrupt the Q the uh, Q and A session. Uh, but there have been um, a, a, a several uh, uh, questions which I think are, re are relatively important, uh, and, and a whole series of questions from one individual attendee at the moment, which we might not be able to cover. But I I, I think to summarise the the questions, and I'd like to ask uh, both panels who've got sufficient panelists who've got sufficient broadband at the moment uh, is uh, details about about uh, workforce support and particularly nurse and midwife support um, what um, strategies have you uh, utilized uh, in order to uh, offer support and what strategies ought we uh, be thinking about as part of the new normal uh, so I'll, I'll ask that question initially to Heather Thank you. Thank you, Gerard. Um, uh, the support that's available to, to nurses, um, uh, as well as all healthcare professionals, are on various levels. So nationally, um, NHS England and the UK have put together um, um, a series of resources and training and also they've signposted um, people to um, groups uh, and initiatives that are happening across the country. Um, so that's being disseminated at the moment through NHS England at a regional level and it's being sent to directors of nursing in order that we um, support our staff by, in organisations. Um, uh, in, in our organisation we've, we've um, made it available for people through our training portal and also we are informing managers how they can support people who come to them on a, on a, on a regular basis or, or a, um, a confidentially. I'm also working quite closely with um, the occupational health department, which we have changed during COVID because we recognize, as, as, as Dorcas mentioned, the impact of being a healthcare professional in this time is actually very, very stressful. Um, what I would also add is being um, a healthcare professional who is, who is black, 
who is uh, from an ethnic minority background or who is connected to another country because they have they are they they have a lived experience of migration to practice their nursing that's a that's a double uh, whammy if you like and my own personal experience i came to this country in 1992 um, and so i came here as a as a, a very young adult um, and I still am connected to my family of origin. The, 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 the only positive of that is that my country, there isn't as much um, uh, danger as it is over here. So I'm comforted by, by that in some respect. Um, but I want to be clear that a lot of our nurses and doctors and professionals working in healthcare um, systems who are from um, an ethnic minority background are connected some way to people that they can no longer see. In addition to which, we have um, overseas nurses who are stranded in their, their countries of origin who aren't able to come back to, uh, to their work. So um, Filipino nurses, nurses from, um, from Africa, from the Caribbean, from, from India, they aren't able to come back and earn a living because of COVID. So that's, um, so in answer to your question, I think we need to look after the people who are here, but also reach out to those nurses um, financially as well, um, because they are um, um, losing um, earnings as a result of this. Uh, so that's that's something we need to blend both the psychological support, but also the practical support during this time. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, um, Annette, I can see that you're back online, I think. Uh, do you want to uh, carry on at this point and um, give us your, your presentation? Oops, I think we may have lost her again. Okay, let's proceed. Uh, uh, Dorcas, do you have uh, any response to the, the previous question? I think you're on mute. I'm sorry, Jed. I missed the part of the last question because I dashed to the kitchen. Um, but you're asking what, what else are we going to do? Uh, yes, but specifically about the health and well-being, really, of our nursing workforce, our future, current, and uh, interestingly, uh, our past nursing workforce who've re who've, who've returned. Uh, what is the new normal for them in terms of health and workforce support, health and well-being support? So much that we need to do. Um, the most vulnerable nurses are, are actually those who are like a working agency, and um, some of the. You know, I'm looking at that data. And some of those deaths that have happened initially have happened outside London. We begin to ask ourselves, did these, is it because these BME nurses did not have agency in terms of voice? Is it be, and we look at language, we look at culture, um, we, we, we look at adaptation. Um, some of us moved to this great institution and this country with a lot of respect. And, and we, 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 it takes a lot of time before you're able to challenge the very system that you have. So how can we give our BME nurses a lot more agency and voice and volume so that they're able to speak to the issues? This speaks to representation at the top. Now, just before this, we were talking, or we're already talking about the white peaks and the fact that BME staff are not represented in the right places that they need to be represented. We've been talking about this for a while, and some of us have been called activists, and we, we've been all, caused all sorts of stuff. But actually, the, the real issues need, have really come up to the top. Do BME staff have the right representation? What does it mean for a junior nurse to see Heather um, a, a, as, as a leader in a clinical practice? What does it mean to a, a, a Filipino nurse to see a, 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 an African nurse managing a ward. So I think the issues of representation need to happen. I'll come back to mental health and say, we need to do much more and, and look at culturally appropriate um, and, and feasible and accepted interventions for our BME staff. We need to address mental health in a way that our staff accept mental health. Anxiety and depression, let's go back to our cultural terms. Kufungi sisa is our word in Zimbabwe of thoughts. Rimuwe mangu, my heart hurts. We know that some of the expressions of mental health are somatized. So let's be really curious, even more curious than we should be about who our BME staff are. And let's go the extra mile and, and, and access them and remove the stigma of accessing healthcare within healthcare services because the price we're paying if we're not doing that is extremely high. And I'll finish by saying one of the hardest issues I've ever had to deal with was a nurse who was working at two o'clock in the morning 
on a night shift and she was called home at three o'clock in the morning. Why? Because a, a son had been stabbed to death. She was a nurse from Africa. Now you do the maths and think about the layers of trauma that we're talking about. She was working an extra shift that night because she needed to send money home back to her country. So we really must appreciate the broader context in which foreign nurses and BME nurses arrive to a healthcare system and support them. Thank you so much indeed. So um, I can now see that um, Annette is back online. Uh, she's on mute at the moment, but I think she's just about to go on, on mute. So I'm going to hand back over to her. And then I understand uh, in typical Uganda UK fashion that uh, Beatrice, uh, the chief nurse of Uganda, has now managed to join us. So I may then go immediately to her and slightly alter the, uh, the agenda. So uh, please bear with us. We will uh, get back on track shortly. Uh, over to you, Annette. Um, thank you very much, Chair, and apologies. Uh, we have bad weather this side. I lost connection temporarily. Uh, but it's a pleasure to be on this forum. And I'm going to share the experiences um, for nurses and midwives in relation to COVID-19. We know that nurses and midwives make up to 50% of the global uh, workforce and they are usually the frontliners. And we also appreciate that COVID-19 evolves rapidly. It's perplexing in nature. We have reports about infections rising rapidly. We have deaths and more of concern is our colleagues who have been infected and some deaths as clearly reported by the ICN report. In Uganda, we have a number of 457 COVID cases. However, what we want, I would like to draw attention to is that it's not the numbers that count, but infection of every single nurse or death of even a single nurse creates a big impact on healthcare outcomes. We've had several experiences, both positive and challenges. Uh, when we talk about the positive experience, we see that nurses are involved in all levels of caring for the COVID-19 uh, patients. Um, we've seen that um, nurses have invested in times of time, in times of passion, and commitment, and we see that this is the time nurses achieve their intrinsic rewards because we are usually called to love and serve. So when you achieve positive patient outcome, it's intrinsically rewarding, and some are those are some of the positive experience. We also see that during this time, uh, nurses have been able to critically think and use innovative and transformative low-cost strategies. Because COVID has stretched the resources, it has caused a lot of disruptions. So we had to think critically how to reorganize the services, how to ensure that the limited available resources are put to good use. And I think so far, we've done our best and it's something nurses and midwives need to celebrate about, I mean, to celebrate. However, on the other side, next slide, we, we look at um, the challenges that, that nurses and midwives face. And it has been a global outcry as far as occupational risks are concerned, issues of safety, require a lot of attention. We are in a situation where health systems are grossly stretched and we have concerns with critical supplies, especially PPEs have clearly, I mean, have been clearly documented. The absence or I mean, lack or limited supply of PPE is of great concern and it poses a daunting challenge to, to the provider. We also look at other stressors like psychological distress, 
And this psychological distress originates from both intrinsic and extrinsic factors. As we know, the challenges of COVID are very unpredictable, being a novel disease. Uh, the nurse and the midwife has to take care of her own emotional well-being and also they have to take care of uh, the emotional well-being of the patients that they serve and that is really challenging. Currently it might look a subtle situation but if we analyzed um, further we'll find that the impact might also uh, be enormous. Then we also look at the physical distress associated with the lockdown restrictions. We've seen that these restrictions, many of them come um, suddenly, they stretch all activities of daily living. Issues such as transport restrictions, social disrupted life, you know, the nurse is a mother, the nurse and midwife is a parent, is a spouse, on top of being a healthcare provider. And there are needs definitely and demands that need to be taken care of. And we find that they are equally affected as far, um, you know, like any other citizen on top of, however, on top of their own professional risks and uh, challenges. Uh, so what do we need as, as nurses to offer our services optimally? We need to look into supportive, safe practice environment. An environment that will take care of the needs of the nurses and midwives. The practice environment that takes care of the concerns of nurses, that listens to the voices of nurses an environment where nurses can be supported further so that they can um, offer their services optimally. Another critical need is the ability to care for oneself. And in self-care, we understand that self-care is self-initiated, it's deliberate, and it encompasses holistic dimensions of one's life. So I urge my fellow nurses and midwives to come up with self-care plans to ensure that we remain healthy, we remain strong, so that we are able to offer our services maximally. However, that cannot be done without the support of the system and other self-care providers. And also to ensure that we achieve self-care needs, we need to tap into each other's uh, um, strengths. We need to enhance teamwork and collaboration. We need to reach out to other partners so that, I mean, and ensure we have collaborations both nationally and globally to ensure that nurses are fully supported and enabled to perform their services. Another critical need that is coming up is we see nurses and midwives work beyond COVID-19 healthcare services. We see other services being affected. When we look at maternal health, that is where um, I work, that's my department, we are experiencing um, a lot of challenges in terms of patients or our mothers uh, also being affected by other res by restrictions. Uh, issues such as transport challenges, access to health services becomes a big challenge. It constrains their, their needs to their need to come for services. And we are seeing situations or conditions that were ably addressed in the past creeping up once again. We um, would also like to see expanded representation 
at the decision-making table. We appreciate nurses and midwives have the potential to address the challenges. We appreciate that nurses are represented at the various decision-making tables, but this needs to be enhanced even further because when we look at the proportion of nurses and the available structures, indeed there is a gap that needs to be filled. And we are very optimistic that given um, the child, uh, given the opportunity to take leadership in these positions, in the various positions, we definitely will be able to maximize our contribution and definitely the outcomes for healthcare will be improved even, um, even further. Um, in conclusion, we totally agree that nurses and midwives are a critical workforce, not only in COVID-19 healthcare services, but also in other services that have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, like I've already mentioned, um, maternal health services. We need to see our babies uh, thrive. We need to see our mothers and babies having a life and rewarding experience. We need also to optimize nurses and midwives potential. Now more than ever, we need to have respectful care and that may not be possible if we are not um, supported, if we are not given the resources uh, that are required. And that calls, I mean, that leads me to my last bullet where I state that health systems need to expedite and prioritize uh, response to nurses and midwives critical needs, yeah. Thank you very much indeed, Annette, and um, I'm very sorry about the broadband issues. Uh, Beatrice has been very kind and let us move on, which I think is, is good. Uh, so what I propose to do is to move straight on to uh, session two, uh, supporting and empowering the nurse, and introduce uh, Tracy Collins, who uh, is... Uh, Head of Global Nursing and the Global Engagement Director of Health Education uh, England and my colleague. Uh, so Tracy, over to you. Thank you very much, Jed, and uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, I just want to say it's a, a huge um, pleasure and privilege to be invited to, uh, to hear and learn from others today and to share some of our experiences um, as well here in the UK. And as, um, as Jed has said, I um, have the great privilege of working with him and his team um, in Health Education England and the Global Engagement Directorate, um, supporting the team with the uh, Global Nursing Agenda. So I just wanted to talk to you today around uh, the support for our international nursing staff. And uh, Mark has already mentioned this morning around um, the numbers of nurses and midwives um, and healthcare workforce from uh, overseas working in the NHS. We have nearly 115,000 international nurses and midwives, mainly from India and the Philippines um, and EU countries. So that is a huge amount of international workforce supporting our NHS um, and particularly at this time. And prior to lockdown, we had 3,000 international nurses that had recently arrived in the UK. So some within a week and some within around four months you know, of preparation and arriving and landing in the UK. And I, I think that's a really important uh, reflective time really to think about that because these nurses, many have never even worked overseas, never been on a plane, said goodbye to their loved ones and families to come and work here in the NHS and step straight into the, uh, the face of a pandemic. So what we had to do, um, uh, you know, within the NHS is to rapidly, you know, increase the amount of staff that we were needing and particularly in critical care skills. Um, and we needed to actually utilize our international workforce sooner than what we would normally do. So our international nurses, when they come to the UK, normally have a supervisory period of time where they're able to come and settle into the NHS and to learn about a new healthcare system but also have that preparation time, practical preparation time, before they actually work 
uh, on the front line. But this was unable to happen and we needed to create a temporary register for these nurses to be able to work as a registered nurse to support the frontline staff but with supervision. So as from yesterday, 2,400 of those staff are actually now on the temporary register and supporting our nurses and healthcare professionals on the front line in the hospitals. So what support have we needed to put into place as a matter of, uh, of speed? Um, we have developed free online resources at Health Education England. It was the e-learning for health team. And this is available for all our international colleagues. And I can share these links with you um, if people are interested at the end of the presentation. But these learning materials, there is a specific element and component there for international staff coming to work in the NHS. And particularly looking after patients with COVID, there is enhancing basic critical care skills and the fundamentals of nursing care, but also some of that pastoral support, which is really pivotal for those that have actually left their families so soon. And as my colleagues have mentioned, there has been a huge uh, high number of our BME colleagues, which um, have been very susceptible to, to COVID-19 and sadly have lost their lives. And particularly Filipino healthcare workers. So we have dedicated support lines that have actually been set up to support our colleagues, you know, to share that support and to talk through the risks and their fears. There's never been more of a time where mental health and well-being is absolutely pivotal. And risk assessments as well for our international colleagues. This has recently been put in place so we can ensure that we give them the right protection and we support them where appropriate. One of the things which we're fortunate in the NHS, and actually these need to be available freely worldwide, is well-being apps. These are available for all our healthcare workers, you know, to help them with psychological well-being and some of the trauma that our nurses and healthcare professionals are facing. These apps need to be available and they need to be available freely for our international colleagues to be able to access as well. One of the programmes which we're, my, myself and some colleagues are actually, uh, literally this week, we're having discussions and hope we want to implement this as soon as possible. But it's a pastoral support and cultural awareness programme, which, where we can deliver a four-staged approach, but particularly the emphasis on psychological well-being and support and to address the fears and how do we help those colleagues that have recently arrived into the UK and a completely new healthcare system work in a new NHS, work with COVID patients, being away from home. So we're hoping this can actually put, be put into place sort of quite soon and be rolled out quickly where we can actually provide that support. And these will be with experts providing that support, psychotherapists that are trained in PTSD. We know there was an image from, which I have to say, I, I, I find it very difficult as a nurse to actually, um, to, to get this image out of my, my thoughts but um, as a critical care nurse one of the one of my colleagues walked into an intensive care unit there was 40 patients in this unit and every patient was COVID-19 and they were being nursed prone so on their front ventilated and how traumatic that is so this is the support that is required from the experts around PTSD and we're hoping to be able to get this up and running as soon as possible. Today, uh, only just before the, uh, the, the conference this morning, one of my colleagues has been supporting a number of nurses which have literally only just arrived just before COVID. And the majority of those nurses tested positive to COVID. So not only did they step off a plane, they've left their families, but actually had to go into quarantine and in isolation. It was a really difficult time. And for the team that was supporting those nurses, they were able to provide that psychological support, the physical well-being as well, send out for provisions, you know, to really ensure they're looked after and supported as much as possible whilst in isolation, but also the terrifying fact that they're tested positive for COVID. Uh, I found that was a really powerful um, story this morning. It was literally just, just before I came onto the conference call of hearing that but how the teams pull together at this time. And it's ironic, isn't it, that the world 
you know, we're, we're facing this pandemic, but actually the world becomes a smaller place when we're all learning and sharing and working collaboratively with each other. I just wanted to talk about a, uh, a, a pilot that we, um, we within Health Education England were running for a few months just prior to, to lockdown. Um, but there's an important message there around the power of social media and how this can be used to provide peer support and to bring groups of healthcare professionals, and um, particular nurses together, where they can share learning, share experiences, but provide that support to each other. And my colleague, Catherine Odecki, was really pivotal in identifying 40 young nurses for the pilot from Uganda. So, so we, we ran these groups through a closed social media platform, one in the UK, one in India, and two in Uganda. And some of the emergent themes that were coming through that was around sharing professional experiences, some of the challenges faced in the healthcare places today, reflective plaque practice, but also health and well-being, and particularly around COVID and the fears that these nurses and colleagues have faced. And since the programme has actually, the pilot has finished, we have kept the groups open just to provide that supportive network, network for those nurses that wish to be part of that. And those conversations and discussions are still going ahead. And my colleague, Catherine Hannaway, I know she's going to be speaking to you later on, and I'm sure she will mention to you as well, she has set something up very similar um, for a group of 300 nurses, where they're able to, again, share experiences and use that as a peer support. And it's important to talk um, through, the, through these times. And Heather, it's wonderful to hear of your, um, your, your leadership programme for your student nurses and how you are looking to, to, uh, to join um, with you know, places in Uganda. And it may be an opportunity uh, to look at a closed social media platform in sort of sharing those groups and bringing people together you know, so they can, uh, they can discuss, um, discuss their work. So that's what I just wanted to share with you today, um, the importance of emotional you know, well-being and the support that we're trying to put in place for our, all our healthcare professionals, but particularly our international nurses as well. It is such an important time for these brave individuals that have left their homes and traveled thousands of miles away, and here they are in a foreign country facing a pandemic and are doing a fantastic job um, I have had some feedback from some of our nurses, in particular, some of the Global Learner Programme nurses, which have come through Health Education England, and they have just been wanting to fight the front line, be their support, look after their patients and do what they, they want to do, and that is to be a nurse. But of course, they're fearful for their families and loved ones at home, but a lot of them never actually thought about their own health and well-being and their own fears they put that aside and were there at the forefront, you know, supporting and helping us, you know, fight this terrible disease. So I just wanted just to, to pause there and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions and answers through our, Thanks, our Tracy. discussions. Much appreciated. I'm, I'm going to move on very quickly because we're running uh, significantly over time. Uh, on to Professor Dame Donna Kinnear. Uh, Donna, I, uh, thank you very much for joining us. You've appeared in video uh, now, which is, which is uh, great. Thank you for making the time this morning. Over to you. Thank you, Jed. Um, and really thanks for inviting me to all the fellow speakers and the, the panel and um, yourself this morning. I think it's really important. I'm going to really talk, focus on the role of the Royal College of Nursing in this pandemic, because we were very clear from the very beginning that our job was to advocate on behalf of our members, but on behalf of nursing as a whole, and really advocate in terms of protecting the individual's nurses' rights, um, offering them support and guidance, that's the Royal College part of it, and really to listen to the voice of our members, but also to articulate and aggregate those voices up and make sure that we advocate on their behalf. So we've taken a series of significant steps throughout this crisis to make sure that we're representing our members and the needs of our members. And I'll take you back to when we started this pandemic, we were already 40,000 nursing staff short in England. 
and we had short, staff shortages, nursing staff shortages across the rest of UK. We were really just beginning to look at the impact of Brexit and how this would affect the future of the workforce. So our prime concern then, as has always been, was how are we going to keep the nursing staff active, safe, and ensure that they have what they need to deliver through this crisis. And we've been working on this throughout the whole of lockdown. We set up a series we were advising prior to lockdown, but as soon as uh, the novel virus presented itself, we, as a, a professional trade union, public safety and the safety of our members was our number one priority. And we knew that one of those things was that nurses everywhere must have the resources they need. So including where appropriate protective equipment for their health, for their safety and their well-being. And we, throughout this, advised government and other experts on specific issues for nursing staff. It may surprise some of you that even our chief nurse in this country wasn't part of some of those meetings that we felt as the Royal College of Nursing, given that, that we are the largest workforce in the health service. How on earth were others going to decide how to mobilise our workforce unless our chief nursing officer was there? So it wasn't just, it was just our voice. It was making sure that we had health and safety and um, our employment conditions, but also how we advised on what nurses could do, how they could step up to the plate. And you'll see that some people have already covered what we've done. Um, we wanted to make sure that when our nursing staff followed the public health guidelines to self-isolate, that our members didn't suffer any financial detriment or loss of pay from being uh, away from work um, on account of public safety. And this was not just in the NHS, but right across the health and social care sector, because we knew that as our members were working in the front line, nurses are in the front line, they would need to take time off as it due to the virus. And we were really, really clear that we were not just um, making sure that they were appropriately paid and um, looked after, but equally, as Mark said earlier, we were there to advise on the mechanics of issues. Um, you, as we started with 40,000 short, we knew that in order to face this can, um, pandemic head on, we needed members that were from retirement to voluntary come and help us and also we had to be aware of the impact on their health. Can you hear me? We can hear you. You can hear me, okay. Yes. It's just it's picked up on my headphones as well. Um, so it was about advising, making sure that um, our, in the interest of public safety that we were advising both how we could get students safely into the workplace, retired members safely back into the workplace, making sure that we protected the employment rights and making sure that we were providing enough um, advice both on how to use PPE, how to make sure that you uh, acquired it from your employer and, and many cases that came or landed on my table were um, about the, the refusal of people hiding behind Public Health England guidance, particularly in some of our mental health services where um, individual nurses were dealing with undifferentiated patients in exactly the same way that they were dealing with it in primary care and yet they were not afforded the same level of protection. So we actually worked with our student committee providing advice and that included calling on the Secretary of State to reimburse tuition fees, for giving current debt for all nursing and midwifery staff after all they had stood up to serve. Um, and we are still working on some of these issues now. Um, we've seen thousands of students join the NHS and social care frontline, um, but actually one of the things that was sacrosanct to us was that it had to be on an individual choice page, uh, basis. So, and we still continue to provide advice to both students and retired members now. Um, just for me, as a, per, a personally, um, just 
listening to what Tracy said earlier, I actually went and volunteered a day a week in our Nightingale unit in East London. And that was mainly because I wanted to be in touch, but I also wanted to see the experience that our nurses and others were going through. And also to provide, I, I really actively believe that if you're going to be a leader, you need to be a supportive leader and understand and know the experiences that your nurses, junior nurses themselves are going through. And I think I saw for myself, um, and, and to be fair, the Nightingale was well supplied, but throughout the country, we knew that there were areas that there was such little supply of PPE, both, both physical, but also psychological protection for our members in terms of, you know, nurses that have been in our profession for a long time were not hearing the calls when individual members were saying how frightened they were about stepping up to serve. And just the taking the time to give them that adequate support. Uh, you know, this one member that I, I think I must have spoken to three or four times in a week that was just asking for a simple mask before she went and um, gave depot injections. And that was refused hiding behind Public Health England guidance. It, is, it was a tantamount to negligence. Um, you will know that I myself have, well, you won't know, but I've written to the Prime Minister, the Health Minister, the Health and Safety Executive to ensure that they are doing what they are, should be doing to ensure the protection of um, all staff in all settings. Um, we have issued guidance and we have made sure that our members and other nurses are able to e escalate concerns when it comes to um, the supply of test, the supply of PPE, the testing, fit testing, and we've been lobbying the government on greater access to testing so that actually um, healthcare members, particularly those in the harder to reach communities such as social care actually have access to this um, and then equally the the differences it seemed really common sense to me that actually if we were sending or deploying nurses and doctors particularly after the first 10 doctors died to the front line to actively work on COVID patients that they themselves needed to be afforded a level of protection and we battled really hard to get Public Health England guidance change because I think an injection of common sense um, that if you're dealing with uh, you're working on a COVID-19 ward you needed to have a level of protection which was not the case or when you were dealing with undifferentiated patients so throughout all of this we've been giving employment advice, both clinical advice, but also in addressing the employment issues related to the, the pandemic. Um, we've been clear that no staff, no member of our nursing staff should be with, faced with financial detriment because of COVID-19. And you'll know how hard we campaigned um, on the deaths of our fellow nursing and medical staff across health and social care. Um, the other thing that I would just want to mention is it, it has to be very, very clear to anybody that's worked in some of the high um, multicultural areas, such as London, the Northwest, that actually when you're working and looking at the, the people in the intensive care unit, that actually they look like you and they look like me. Let me just acknowledge that. So what I was absolutely struck the first day that I worked in that unit that um, 29 out of 30 patients were men. And secondly, 28 out of 30 patients were from BAME communities. So I didn't have to wait for the Public, Eng Public Health England report to tell me what my eyes could see, particularly when I was seeing the deaths of my colleagues flashing up on TV. But what we do need to do now is make sure that we're part of the voices that addresses this disproportionate impact on BAME communities. It can, this is an opportunity for us. And you know, whether it's multifactorial, what we do need to ensure is where we can do things about it, such as providing PPE, such as making sure that those that are, have underlying conditions um, are redeployed from the front line, we should do something about it. It's essential that we're very, very clear as a community that it's, it's not a choice that somebody else decides your, uh, your fate in life. It has to be our own child choice, even if 
we are dedicated to providing care to the citizens of this country. And we have worked right across the world. Um, we've worked with our colleagues in Italy, we've worked with our colleagues in Korea, um, right across the world to, to actually make sure that information that we are providing to our members has been tested. And we're working with every single stakeholder that there can be. And as you know, our overseas nurses we have been working with, we've heard their voices and we do understand some of the difficulties that they're facing. And literally you'll see that we had been lobbying this government on the immigration health sur surcharge since 2015 when it was a Congress item. So COVID has given us a lot of pain, but it has given us a lot of opportunities to ensure that we can work together because some of the inequalities that it has shone a light on have been there in every single condition that we have faced in this country. It is now out, this has shone a light on it and it gives us the opportunity to address some of those root causes together. Thank you. Donna, thank you very much indeed for that uh, in, in, insight and particularly a, a, an insight into wise leadership, which I think is, um, has been key to uh, a, a lot of positivity during this very, very difficult time. Um, I, uh, again, am very conscious of time. We have two speakers left in this uh, particular session before uh, I, I want to ask His Excellency to uh, say some words. I also noticed that Beatrice is, is uh, on the line and appearing in, in, um, uh, in video. May I suggest uh, that for those of you who can, that we extend uh, this session till 12.30. And I ask uh, uh, Beatrice, uh, followed by uh, Elizabeth, followed by Catherine, to give somewhere between five and eight minutes each with Julius uh, wrapping up the meeting. Uh, uh, would you be happy to do that, Julius? Do you have the time to do that? Okay, so um, Beatrice, can I ask you to say a few words? I think you're on mute, Beatrice. Uh, Beatrice, Beatrice, I, I, I think you're on mute. I think you, your um, your machine is on mute. Can, could you unmute it? That's fine. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, you're still on mute. Is it okay now? Can I it's, okay, it's okay now, yes, thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm happy to be here now. Good afternoon, viewers. Uh, as you are all aware, COVID-19 is a respiratory uh, tract infection, which has actually caused uh, infection among a number of people. Very many millions of people have suffered from this virus. And uh, there's a lot of research going on to look at the natural history of a disease, as well as the uh, epidemiology of this disease. Uh, I must say in Uganda, the nurses are doing a lot. They are involved in the management of COVID-19, and they're involved right from the national level up to the, uh, the frontline nurses. When you look at in Uganda, at the national task force, we have nurses who are participating. At the district level, there is a task force where nurses are involved. In the institutions where the cases are, we have nurses. And actually, the lead people at the institutions are the nurses. And when we talk about frontline nurses, we're actually meaning all the nurses who are involved in the case management of COVID. Not necessarily those who are in the areas where there are only patients, even those who are on the other side. Because as you are all aware, COVID-19, 80% are asymptomatic, and 15% need uh, admission, and only 5% may need critical care. So even at the other points of care, we may have patients with COVID. So that's why all the front health care nurses and midwives are responsible in management of COVID-19. So what are the nurses in Uganda doing? Uh, there is a lot of training going on in Uganda. They, it first targeted the nurses who are on case management, but it has been faced to all the other nurses in the, in the institutions where 
COVID-19 patients are. And the nurses, the majority of trainers are nurses. And the nurses play a big role in the training. Uh, infection control, that is IPC, infection prevention and control. I want to bring the example of Mulago Hospital, where I have just been of recent. You find that the nurses who are, the, the, the health workers who are leading the IPC team, the IPC team are the nurses and they are doing a very great job. They make sure that there are guidelines. They make sure that they demarcate all the areas according to the uh, level of infection. The, inf the area for high infection, the area for uh, uh, low risk, as well as green areas. They take the responsibility of making sure that the health workers within the facility don't get exposure to infection. And they, they also get involved with the training of IPC. Uh, nurses are involved in the, uh, taking care of, uh, as you are all aware, that nurses actually are custodians of resources in the hospitals. They are the ones who keep most of the resources. The PPE we are talking about, actually when people talk about PPE, they only look at masks. But PPE is a, is a, a combination of a number of protective equipments. But you find that the nurses are custodians. They are the ones who take care of these war, these uh, stores where these things are where the PPE are stored. They are the ones who distribute the PPEs, and they are the ones who know how many should be brought and how many should be ordered at a particular time. So it's a key role for the nurses in Uganda to make sure that the PPE are available and they are properly used. Uh, when we talk about uh, workshops the nurses make sure that their colleagues have short workshops. They are not supposed to have these 12 hours. Of course, we are aware that some countries or some institutions, they have a 12 hour workshop. But for the case of COVID-19, it will be very difficult for health workers, especially the nurses, to have a 12 workshop because it will expose them to the infection. And you know, exposure to COVID-19 is uh, either a bolus or continuous intermittent infection exposure. So we, we tend to use short work shifts and even in a shift, the nurses have to go only once. So you, you end up having many nurses at the same time in that shift so that they go only once when they are managing patients with the COVID. Continuous surveillance. Nurses are involved in continuous surveillance of COVID-19 among their colleagues as well as uh, in the community. The nurses are involved and they go uh, health educating, uh, support the lab as you are all aware in COVID-19 case management. It's not only the duty of nurses, it is uh, a teamwork where you get other spectrum of health workers. But you find that the nurses participate in each and every level of these activities. I still want to bring the example of Mulago Hospital because we have now a number of patients there and we started this work as we were back uh, March. We had uh, a psychosocial team and this psychosocial team they are all the nurses who are taking the lead of the psychosocial team and they uh, attend to the patient but also to their colleagues, the doctors, the allied professionals, as well as the support staff. We are all important, including the cleaners. Um, we, we also tend to involve a number of nurses in the care, in case management of COVID-19. Because no nurse should be, we should get burned out. So we intend to involve the number of nurses, and the nurses we involve, it should not be coerced to do anything. We request them, we ask them, and they should voluntarily give. We have already heard about some places where nurses are burnt out, where nurses are psychologically tortured just like any other health worker where uh, some people may not be, you know, COVID-19 is a new virus and uh, 
the epidemiology is still being studied. So we involve nurses who voluntarily accept so that when they are there, they are ready to serve. Uh, I think that is the few I can say at this time. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Beatrice. That's very, very much appreciated. So um, can I uh, quickly move on to uh, Elizabeth, uh, uh, back onto the, the subject of supporting and empowering the nurse. Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Chair, and I thank you, every panelist and uh, the organizers. And uh, having had the sharing that we have had, uh, what is going on around the globe concerning COVID-19, we realize that there are a number of issues that have come up as far as nursing and middle phrase concerned in the profession. And uh, we recognize that uh, it is very important to recognize the nurses and midwives in, forms, in terms of respect of what they do, in terms of appreciation. We've had uh, uh, some messages of appreciation that motivate our fellow nurses and midwives and uh, when we are offering the care. So in the way forward, we need to look at how we have to move on and engage ourselves to support ourselves and to continue providing the care that we need to provide. One thing that we pick and we must focus on is that we must engage in the lifelong learning as nurses and midwives. And uh, this COVID-19 gives us good lessons Yes, it came on, we never knew, but we have had to learn on the job. So we must embrace work-based learning. We must take up uh, self-assessment, assessment of the situation, identify the resources we have, identify the areas that we need and the resources that we need so that we can inform the team members to come together in order to address the situation. So worker-based learning is really the way to go. And the second thing we have seen that has worked with us is engaging in online learning because schools have been shut, but we are moving on into online education. Even in nurses, whatever we are, we must engage in online learning. And just like uh, Catherine was answering, to do with the continuous professional development. Yes, as the Uganda National and Midwives Council, we engaged and we have taken on the World Continuous Education Alliance to provide the free continuous professional lessons. But we also call upon other teams and other organizations that can impact our nurses and midwives to register with the council so that they can really provide these services. The second thing I want to emphasize in supporting our nurses and midwives, as professionals, we really need to take on the self-care. I know we have been in the profession of serving compassionately and looking at the client as the first line person. But remember, you need to be safe in order to provide safe care. So this is a support that we need to bring on and embrace. We need to recognize our rights as professionals. We need to take it up and uh, ensure that we provide safe care to our clients. Yes, we have looked at the challenges that are surrounding us in this COVID-19, especially in the healthcare system, in the healthcare facilities, surrounding us as professionals, but also probably as in nations and in the society. Those are things that we need to look into as professional nurses and midwives. We need to embark on research. We need to investigate to find out what kind of care modalities are relevant to the society. What kind of care approaches do we employ to provide safe and quality care? What kind of care modalities do we need to engage in? If we are getting uh, 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 PPEs and some may be some people reacting to them, 
uh, maybe there are issues that are concerning the PPEs. You have learned from our commissioner, Beatrice said, it is nurses who know the right PPEs, who know the amounts that are needed, who know uh, who should do, which ones to be used when at what level. We need to engage in these investigative approaches into this uh, personal protective equipment so that we inform the organizations that are making them, that are producing them on what will be relevant in our, to our professionals, but also the community that we serve. Lastly, I want to just say that what have we done in Uganda in terms of maybe research, investigating into this COVID-19? I want to appreciate uh, the fellow colleagues in Uganda that have come up and we have tried to look into the, 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 the effect of COVID-19 into our care. It is a survey that is ongoing, but we need to do a comprehensive investigation so that we get clear evidence and inform us, inform the policy level, inform the, the parliamentarians on how we need to engage ourselves in overcoming the COVID-19. Therefore, I would call upon us. It is very good that we are on this platform. I, I really advocate that we need to come up with the international teams, research teams as nurses and midwives. We need to probably develop a research agenda as nurses and midwives, not only in Uganda, but maybe internationally that will help us particularly the issues surrounding the pandemics such as COVID-19. And we can be able to investigate, come up with new knowledge, come up with new approaches so that we are able to move together and provide the quality of care that our societies really need and also keep ourselves safe. With those few remarks, I would like to say thank you so much. We need to work together. Thank you, Elizabeth. Very, very much appreciated. And um, uh, uh, last but certainly not least of our um, uh, uh, speakers um, uh, before wrapping up, um, I'd like to welcome welcome Catherine uh, from, uh, I'm not quite sure what part of the world that you are in at the moment, but I'm, I'm guessing it's islands. But uh, over to you, Catherine. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jed, and uh, thank you for inviting me here. It's wonderful to look at the list of uh, people who are uh, not only on the panel, but are tuned in and see so many names and, and faces, people that I've met and people that I now know, even if it's only virtual. And uh, no, I'm not in Northern Ireland right now. I'm at home in North Yorkshire in, in England and it's pouring with rain. Um, but uh, my, my job today, I think, um, is to tell you uh, a little bit about the work that I am doing. Many of you I have met previously through my, my previous role as the former project manager and the acting executive uh, campaign director for the Nursing Now Global campaign, which um, was set up along with Lord Nigel Crisp there and um, a wonderful global team of experts. And uh, it, it was my first first introduction actually to Africa to come over um, to do some work with you over there in Uganda um, and to come to the launch of Nursing Now along with Lord Chris and uh, Professor Jed. How wonderful that was and I've uh, continued my travels around Africa where I could working with the nurses and the teams particularly young nurses and midwives. Um, I'm now the programme director for the Nightingale Challenge Programme in Northern Ireland, where we uh, designed and are running a one-year global leadership programme for 30 of their young nurses and midwives. So I thought I'd use that as a case study for you today, um, just telling you what we're doing, how we've actually managed to engage through that program with young nurses and midwives in Africa and beyond, in fact, almost all around the world, and the effects that COVID-19 has had upon trying to run a programme like that. Um, I think Lord Chris said at the beginning that some of the programmes were paused around the world for the Nightingale Challenge. Uh, we decided in Northern Ireland that we mustn't pause. As difficult as it was, 
there is never a more important time for young leaders to actually have that support that the Nightingale Challenge was offering to them. So under quite difficult circumstances, we've continued with that programme. So the programme is a one year programme, five learning events where they come together um, when they can uh, to learn together across the 30 and into those events we managed to bring virtually and link up with as many global young nurses as we could. At the first workshop um, we linked directly with the Aga Khan University um, in, in um, uh, Kampala and a whole room full of your uh, young students, uh, midwives actually, that were there and had a live conversation in a room on a big screen. It was wonderful. So the workshops have continued. They are about leadership skills. They're about advocacy. They're about policy making. They're about quality improvement and global health issues as well as population health. The focus is global. Think global, act local and how do we actually make that happen and how do we support these young leaders, young nurses and midwives in their journey? How do we help them to have that voice? To our very first workshop we invited Penny Wampamba who I think is probably on the call now and she came over to Belfast to, uh, to learn, to talk about her work in, um, in, in um, Uganda but also to share and to meet new people. Um, as well as the learning events through the year they were expecting to have global visits. Now this is not the year for global visits for anybody um, but we managed one. We managed to get some of the young nurses and midwives to go to London to the Commonwealth Wealth Nurses and Midwives Federation Conference, where Lord Crisp also hosted um, a, a visit for them there to Parliament, and um, Dame Donna hosted a visit to the Royal College of Nursing, as well as taking them to the Florence Nightingale Museum and the Mary Seacole statue right there. We were very fortunate that we could bring in some global nurses, including a young um, Ugandan nurse, to come and join that programme with us. And I think as well, Winnie is on this call too and a great advocate she has been for uh, Uganda and young nurses. So we began to grow that family um, around the work that we were doing, bringing in wherever we could, making those links. There was mentoring and networking and we're using, we were already using this technology before the, uh, the, the, the virus hit. But I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how we've tried to transfer this into ways of working as under the constraints that we have got. The networking was great, but um, we need to continue to do that in other ways. The global visits obviously had to stop. Beyond London, we had planned to go to the Exocon conference. Some of the young nurses and midwives were to speak there. We'd hoped to come to Uganda in October to the big nursing and midwifery conference and bring the young nurses with us. And we were also hoping to be more involved in the African Advanced Nurse Practitioner Coalition and come out out to some of those conferences. Um, uh, all of that work and our links with Bongi, who I also think may be on the call here. So how could we change that? How could we make it work? What did we need to do? Well, firstly, the young nurses from Northern Ireland, as well as those global ones, needed much more one-to-one -one support. So it meant a lot more telephoning, a lot more video on a one-to-one -one basis, helping them get through what had become a very difficult time for them. Um, specific development tools that we had planned to use needed to be shifted. They wanted more on personal health and well-being. Where were those apps? What were those links? They wanted to understand more about change and transition and the models they could use and use themselves but with their teams. They needed to know more and develop more on personal resilience. How did they do that? What was the bounceability thing that they were going to need to grasp? and understand more about their spheres of influence. What could they change and what couldn't they? So we set up Facebook groups, two, two Facebook groups actually, a global one which now has 300, many Afri young African nurses and midwives have joined that and they're able to talk through that network, a private group but open to everybody, it's called the Nightingale Challenge Northern Ireland Goes Global.
and there it is that people can um, apply in anybody 35 and under who's a qualified nurse or a midwife and we also set one up just for all the nightingale people in northern ireland so you know for africa maybe there's something that everybody could do in africa together um, but certainly we have many young Africans have joined that cohort. We've set up global buddying and a peer mentoring system so that all those 30 in Northern Ireland are now being buddied up across the world on one-to-one, -one, one to two basis. And we've got many young uh, Africans involved in that too. We try to find existing groups like the group that went off last year to the World Health Assembly. Um, they are already there. They understand some issues about global health and they were very keen to link in. What we want to do with that is learn, as um, Tracy said, about the work that's being done and has been done, the pilot that's gone on. What can we learn and build on to make this really work? So the global learning visits are on hold for now, but as soon as we can, we will try to see how we can link and make those um, opportunities as best that we can. And we've extended the program until June next year so that we can really help and to give a voice to these young people. As we've said, it's the new normal, not the old one. And we need to help prepare those young people as they go. We need to mentor them and support them through it. But alongside the year of the nurse and the midwife, COVID-19 has given us the perfect storm all around the world. This is about investment in nursing and healthcare. And never was it more important that we grasp that, get that seat at the table, nothing without us about us. Thank you. Catherine, thank you very much indeed. I'm, I'm sorry about the uh, timings. Uh, it's my great pleasure to um, welcome, I, 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 I admire your patience, Julius. It's been, uh, I've, I've noticed the concentration that you've had over the last two and a half hours. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you here. And, and uh, for those of you who, who do not know His Excellency, he's been um, an absolute stalwart supporter of uh, the health relationship between the UK and Uganda uh, since he uh, 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 came to the UK several years ago now, uh, has become a friend to Uganda UK and I'm absolutely delighted uh, that he uh, can give us his thoughts and also perhaps wrap up the meeting for us as well. Uh, Your Excellency. Uh, thank you very much Chair for this session. Health Education England, Moses Mulimira, the coordinator of Uganda UK Health Alliance, our host, the SSCG Consulting, honorable speakers at this event, invited e-guests, ladies and gentlemen. A pity that we are unable to meet face to face during this moment, occasioned by coronavirus. I hope we shall be able to meet again in the nearby future. May we observe a moment of silence to all frontline staff in the health sector in Africa, UK and around the world who have lost their lives in fighting COVID-19. May their departed souls find eternal rest. We also extend our condolences to everyone who lost their dear ones to COVID-19. And may we pray that those who have been infected get well soon. COVID-19 is a threat to humanity. By this time last year, 2019, we had no idea on what we shall face. Our plans for the year went as we had planned. Then came COVID-19 at the end of the year and beginning of January, 2020. This disease caught us unaware. And as we move forward, we need to put in place contingency plans to ensure that our health sector is well staffed, well equipped, and well motivated. Africa is still faced with killer diseases like malaria, TB, HIV AIDS, and others. From time to time, some countries get attacked by Ebola. In fact, just this listening to the, to the media, some attacks have been reported in, in the DRC. If you add COVID-19 to the equation, you come face to face with the reality of facing, facing the sector. Government of Uganda recognizes that nurses and midwives constitute the core of Uganda healthcare system. That we are rebuilding from scratch 
since a near total breakdown in 1986, when NRM government came to power and found no infrastructure to be proud of in the health sector. Hospitals were empty. There were no beds. There were no equipment. There were just empty shelves. A lot of medical personnel left the country over the years from 1971 to 1986 and beyond. Uganda continued to train doctors, nurses and midwives, and other cadres to man the sector. Let me give you some interesting statistics on nurses and midwives in Uganda. Uganda, Uganda currently has 73,000 nurses. 73,000 nurses employed in the public sector. Compared to 3,000 in 1986, you've got the figures. 1986, there were 3,000. Currently, as I speak now, there are 73,000 nurses. This is 2,333 percentage increase in number of nurse, nurses and midwives, showing how committed government of Uganda is or as attached to the importance of nurses in the health sector. No nurses, no health, and no health means no wealth. Uganda was the first country in Africa to embrace Nursing Now campaign that advocates for the voice of nursing community to enable them to enjoy their career. I attended the global launch of Nursing Now in London, and I also attended Nursing Now Ugandan chapter launch. For the first time in history, the voices of nurses are being heard, at least for the case of Uganda, and I think UK at local level. They should also be heard at the WHO level as raised by Rose. I saw a question raised by Rose, Primrose. The voice has to be put on the table. The voices of the nurses should be heard. Nursing now has spread countrywide in Uganda challenges notwithstanding. We believe these challenges make us do our work better. We will not shy away from challenges. We'll, we'll keep jumping over these challenges. We urge all African countries to embrace Nursing Now campaign for the benefit of all. Uganda has continued to train personnel, rehabilitate and equip hospitals and health centers to serve the nation. The threat of COVID-19 is being mainstreamed in our healthcare system as we did for HIV AIDS, and we shall continue to create capacity to, to, to manage outbreaks and epidemics like COVID-19. So far, as also reported by our chief nurse, there have been no COVID-19 deaths. Out of 500 cases and 82 recoveries have been reported as of yesterday. The primary focus of Uganda now is a two-pronged approach. Firstly, a gradual and phased approach to reopen the country while managing the pandemic. And secondly, to resuscitate the economy by stimulating investments in critical sectors while focusing on import substitution to save foreign exchange. All these are aimed at generating resources to continue providing services to Ugandans. COVID-19 has affected Uganda's physical needs, and in the short to medium term, government tax revenue targets shall not be realized. However, using locally generated funds and borrowed funds from bilateral and multilateral sources, we have continued to provide better working conditions compared to 10 years ago for nurses and doctors, providing PPEs and remunerating them well as we manage COVID-19 and other killer diseases. President Museveni has made it clear to Ugandans to innovate and industrialize during this crisis to generate jobs, incomes, and domestic taxes. It is the only sustainable way in the long run to serve our nation until a vaccine or other curative medicines have been engineered. International routes for, car for cargo were not closed Cargo to and from Uganda flowed to across our borders with minimum interruptions because all drivers had to be tested at the border points. While launching a factory for manufacturing face masks in Mukono, 
two weeks ago. He said, Uganda has got enough raw materials to feed industries for production of commodities rather than continue relying on heavily on imports, which he said were unsettling the economy, especially during the crisis like now we are facing. To conclude, in Uganda and throughout Africa, there is a continued need to further strengthen capacity building for nurses. At the same time, we should continue building our economies. The capacities for nurses are being advocated by nursing now, and we call for a more mutual collaboration and sharing of experiences between nurses in UK and African countries. Sharing of experiences can be online or it can be through institutional exchanges where a group of nurses make trips to Africa and groups of nurses from Africa make trips to UK on a structured basis. Through this structured and mutual capacity building, Africa and UK shall have a stronger nurses-centered healthcare, healthcare sector for the benefit of all. I thank you for your attention. May God bless you. Your Excellency, thank you very much indeed. Uh, um, I very quickly, 30 seconds, uh, sum up. I think we have uh, really gone global uh, over the course of um, uh, the last two and a half hours. We've um, focused on uh, populations, uh, individuals, individual healthcare workers, uh, leadership, both locally and nationally, and bilateral and multilateral partnerships. Um, I am extremely grateful to His Excellency, uh, to Lord Nigel Crisp, who, uh, true to his word, as ever, has returned and is back uh, listening to um, uh, the activity as it goes along, to all of our speakers, despite the technological uh, issues. Uh, we are really grateful for uh, the support of uh, our global uh, engagement efforts uh, and the Uganda-UK uh, Health Alliance. And it just leaves me to say thank you very much and stay well and be safe and hopefully we shall see you shortly goodbye thank you for thank you everyone thank you for joining us thank you thank you thank you it's been a pleasure Good to see you, Catherine. Good to see you too, Collins. Catherine, hi, bye. 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 Stay, stay safe, everyone, and have a bye. good afternoon. Okay, thank you. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.